Okay. We'll call a meeting to order. Good evening, everyone. My name is Richard Stewart, and on behalf of City Council, I want to welcome you all to this evening's public hearing. It's a public hearing into the bylaws that will be introduced to you in a moment by the City Clerk. Council for the City of Coquitlam has given first reading to these bylaws and has directed that a public hearing be held. Staff from the City's Planning and Development Department will first present a summary of uh, the, the proposed bylaw. And the floor will then be opened to anyone in attendance that wishes to present his or her views on that bylaw. Those that are pre-registered will be given the first opportunity to speak. So I stress to you all that this is a public hearing. It's an opportunity for anyone who has a view on the proposed bylaw to make that view known to council members. We're all here to, with an open mind and we're here to listen to your input. No one here has prejudged the outcome of these bylaws. But there are some rules that council has asked me to enforce. One, it's not a question and answer period. It's not an opportunity to debate, debate the merits of the proposed bylaw with uh, council members, with staff, or with people in the audience who, with whom you might, have, uh, you might disagree about the, the proposed bylaw. So we ask that you all restrict your comments to the proposed bylaw before us at that moment. Be as brief and concise as possible. We ask uh, speakers to respect a five, limit time, five minute time limit so that everyone who wishes to speak is able to do so. If you've still got some good stuff after that, you can get to the end of the line and after we've heard from everyone at least once, then you can take a second or third opportunity to uh, continue as long as it's new information. We ask that the audience be respectful of each speaker and allow that speaker to make his or her views known without interruption. And to that end, we, uh, we ask for no clapping, no booing, no cheering, no jeering uh, of any of the presentations made this evening. As chair of the hearing, I reserve the right to conclude any presentation that does not relate to the bylaw that becomes repetitive or becomes abusive. Please note that if you wish to provide a written submission to be included in the official record of tonight's meeting, you have to hand the written submission into the clerk desk right here prior to adjournment of that item on the agenda. Under rules established by court judgments, council cannot receive any further information after the public hearing has been closed and before council has given final consideration, yes or no, to the, to the proposed bylaw. Immediately following adjournment of the public hearing tonight, we'll have a regular council meeting in order that council can give consideration to items on the public hearing agenda, as well as a number of other items on our regular council agenda. Uh, if, however, during the public hearing, uh, a council member asks for additional information and, it's, and staff don't have it at that moment, we can actually postpone the consideration of that item uh, until another meeting after the requested information has been received. I will now call on Mr. Gilbert to introduce the other bylaws on tonight's agenda and planning and development staff to make a presentation on the first item. Thank you, Worship. The first item this evening is an application to amend City of Coquitlam zoning bylaw number 3000 in order to rezone the property at 1276 Hollybrook Street and 1277 Creekstone Terrace from RS2 one family suburban residential to RS8 Large Village Single Family Residential. This is bylaw number 4631. Planning City of Coquitlam. Uh, item one tonight uh, is for a property that's on double fronting on Creekstone Terrace, as well as Hollybrook. Uh, it's just north of Gizleson Avenue. The property is currently designated Large Village Single Family in your community plan. And the proposed subdivision is for 13 lot. Uh, layout with a new collector road that would connect uh, Creekstone Terrace and Hollybrook Street. Staff recommend that council grant second and third and fourth reading to bylaw 4631 2015. Thank you. Okay, I don't have a speaker's list for this item. So I'll call. Are there any speakers to this item? Are there any speakers to this item? Third and final time, are there any speakers to this item? Seeing none, I'll declare this item closed. We're one quarter of the way through. 
Item number two is an application to amend C Coquitlam Zoning Bylaw number 3000 to rezone the properties at 509 and 513 Clark Road from CS1 Service Commercial to C7 Transit Village Commercial. This is bylaw number 4625. Thank you, um, Chris Jarvie, once again. Item two on the agenda tonight is for an application for rezoning at uh, 509 513 Clark Road. The property has current frontage along North Road, Clark Road, and Smith Avenue to the north. The current land use designation on the property is Transit Village Commercial. <clears throat> for the development, the applicant is uh, proposing to take access to the loading and the parking from North Road. Uh, they will have townhouses facing Smith Avenue, as well as some commercial units fronting along Clark Road. The proposal is for 23-story mixed-use buildings with 193 apartments, as well as a commercial podium. Staff recommend that Council grant second and third reading to bylaw 4625-2015. Thank you very much. We have uh, one registered speaker, Mr. Keith Hempel from Rossich Hempel Architects. Very good, thank you. Thank you. So um, I know you're fairly familiar with this project already, so I'm not really gonna give a very detailed presentation, but a quick overview for you as well as for the benefit of the public. Thank you. Um, so as I said, it's a mixed use building with a residential tower on top of commercial podium and the context uh, of course Chris has just shown us where, where uh, Clark uh, veers off toward uh, toward the northeast at North Road. <clears throat> Ground floor, uh, Chris already mentioned sort of where the loading and things was but this is the essence of the mixed use portion. The green area in the, on the lower left uh, of the project is all commercial uses and it's been subdivided into smaller spaces that uh, in, in a minute I'll come back to when we see some of the other images but um, with two significant uh, plazas, one at the south and one at the, at the north end of Clark. Um, so we're, we're hoping to orient the, the south end in particular to what is almost certain to be a restaurant and, and engage with that uh, plaza on the south portion. Well, we have an opportunity on the north end of the, of the road also, which is on the right, lower right, um, to have another uh, commercial use very similar, either coffee shop or something, which would be very much engaging with the public and, and to, again, to take advantage of the plaza at that end. The red colored uh, uh, image, uh, part of the image to the right on uh, Smith is uh, the lower floor of two-story townhomes. And they, again, are, are on that side and, and presenting a residential frontage to the context, which to the north of us is also residential. Um, and then we've tried to contain all of the service functions within the building, and that's that sort of polka-dotted uh, portion in the middle of the top of, of the drawing there. That's where the principal entrance is for the for the underground parking as well as the and it all happens through a single door on that side. So we've tried to minimize that opening and contain as much of the service functions of the, of the project within the building. Um, if you move up one level on top of the commercial floor, we have a fairly substantially landscaped podium. Um, the main portion of the tower base sits on the right portion of that. And on the left side, we've, we've located the amenities. So they have uh, access to fairly substantial amount of open landscaped area and it's connected via pathways through into the main, uh, the main tower on the second level. So with that, I'll just give you a quick sort of walk around tour and then uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that and share your interest to hear from the, the public. So on the west side, this would be the main entrance and uh, uh, lobby uh, doors to the residential portion of the building. Uh, we have a kind of an extended canopy to announce the entrance to the street and a, a rather plaza-like uh, patio area that comes out and leads you to the main entrance of the building. You just see on the left the, the uh, beginning of the townhome. So if we walk around the building kind of clockwise uh, from Smith Avenue here, we're looking back on this side slide to the uh, two-story city homes. And again, that's the, the residential character that we're trying to present across to the, to the context to the north. Um, the, if you back up as we go further around the, the building onto uh, to Clark and, and a bit further north, you get a better idea of what the building looks like in context with the, with the base of the building, uh, the commercial base. 
And of course, the relationship, I think the important thing is here, <laughs> the relationship to the, uh, the transit line. Uh, if you move in a little bit on that, you can see the, the front doors and the, and the plaza that I was referring to earlier on the north. One thing that we're really trying hard to do is to, uh, is to really emphasize the pedestrian uh, aspects of the site. And we know that with the, the transit-oriented development that that, and the close proximity to the station that we will see a substantial increase in pedestrian traffic. And we're trying to address that and provide uh, interesting street frontage, especially along, along Clark, uh, Clark's, or, which is on the, uh, the left side of this image. You can see the umbrellas, a little bit of seating in, indoors and out. And then uh, if we move further around um, uh, and come up a little bit, this would be more or less what you would see from the SkyTrain. You can see the extent of the landscaping on the top of the Clint. And again, moving a bit further south, Another view that shows the, uh, the, the articulated facade with the commercial along there. And something that we've tried to do is to break that into smaller, sort of more interesting uh, rhythm of, of architecture, especially if uh, it's for people walking along that street. Now, we know that Clark Road is fundamentally a busy traffic road, and one of the things we're trying to do is marry that with the notions of having pedestrian-friendly frontage. So we're trying to offer opportunity there for interesting retail. Um, Coming right to the south, we can see the South Plaza and, and where we've indicated the, the restaurant, that first sort of three major bays of that would be uh, the restaurant use. And we're providing a, an outdoor patio area with a little bit of a higher than usual guardrail around that to help attenuate sound from, from the street. You can see in that same view above on the second floor, that's where we have our, our amenity space. And I think interestingly at night, that will be kind of a, a, a good character is this is kind of a gateway project when you're coming up from the south. And the, the amenities building would always, of course, be lit. So it'll have, be a bit of a, a lantern-like character to it. Uh, backing up and going further south along Clark, Clark looking back, you get a, a sense again of how the, the tower would sit above the plinth. And, and our interesting proposed uh, city's own public art in the foreground there, the, uh, the, the art pieces something that will happen probably just after the construction of the site so it doesn't get damaged, but that's what's been proposed there. And that's really all I wanted to, to do is give you a quick overview and uh, allow the public to see a bit more of this than they might have. And there are areas for questions if required. Thank you, Mr. Hempel. I see no questions. Very good then. Are there any other speakers to this item? Any other speakers to this item? Councillor Zerillo. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask about the crosswalk. This is going to be on the other side from the SkyTrain station, so there's going to be lots of people running across. I just wanted to understand what we're doing with crosswalks and if they will be lighted crosswalks. Okay. Thank you, Through Your Worship. Uh, the most uh, logical c uh, pedestrian connection would be at Smith Avenue, which will be a lighted intersection. Okay, so Smith across Clark, because right now they're offset, and it's quite a wide, because it's on a diagonal, it's quite wide there. So are, you, are we going to go to the north side of Smith and cross, or are we going to cross from the south side? would allow for crossing on both the north and the south side. Uh, so will they be lighted like I'm thinking about once it's dark after five o'clock at night in the winter and in the evening? Is it going to be a lighted cross crosswalk all the way across or is it just a walk sign, regular traffic light? Mr. Diazegui. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the information I have at hand indicates that uh, the city has requested the uh, proponents, uh, traffic and transportation consultant, to design at the south side of Smith a new urban traffic island. The purpose of this island is obviously to reduce the crossing width for pedestrians and provide some refuge while they attempt to cross the road. So we. So there will be an island in the middle there? 
Well, the island is going to be probably at the tip of the intersection of Smith and Clark in the um, southwest uh, quadrant. At that point, it's a five-lane cross-section three and two then, I guess? Correct. The left turn. Is right? Is, I guess what I'm trying to understand is, is there going to be flashing these people crossing the street here, or is it just a regular traffic light? Unfortunately, I don't have information on that at hand. But it would be similar to pedestrian crossings here in city center at traffic lights. So that's a major traffic signal signalized intersection. Totally get it, but this is uh, people are going to be going to the SkyTrain station. There's going to be a, just going to be a lot more people running to and fro. That's all I'm concerned about. And even in city center at this point. Uh, when Mr. Ma Mr. McIntyre, Mr. McIntyre, Your, Your Worship, um, we have some preliminary um, drawings. We have some drawings as part of the package. Um, that we're not quite at the full-blown development permit DP stage where we'd have those sort of site-specific details. But based on what we have here, and perhaps the uh, the applicant's uh, consultant can confirm this. Our understanding would be, as you described, it'll be a fully urbanized intersection with uh, uh, signalized intersections, uh, including. Uh, pedestrian uh, protected crossings. Um, there are corner bulges proposed, I think, along the, the Clark frontage, again, to narrow that travel distance across Clark Street. So we're just, based on the <clears throat> um, the package drawings we've got right now, this, again, this is not the full development permit design package. That's that's what we see here right now. I'll be interested in that because, too, if, you know, if children are going to school in Coquitlam or just see it as being a busy crossing and I'd like to see how it's going to be coordinated. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to put it in context. Uh, the corner of Lincoln and Pine Tree, which I think is either a five lane or six lane configuration, uh, but as high rises on both sides of the street, again, it's right at a, uh, a SkyTrain station. Would it be a similar configuration in traffic signalization? I'm looking to Mr. Jarvie. Yes. Nods. Okay. <laughs> Your Worship, what, again, I, I, all I can say is what I got in front of me in terms of, of these conceptual sketches, these drawings. Uh, it's a four lane cross section across Clark. I think it's correct. There is a little bit of an offset in those intersections. That would be in part addressed through the corner bulges at the corner and the, uh, the traffic island, the pedestrian island that uh, uh, Mr. Diozeghi referred to. Um, if council supports rezoning, we'll make sure that this is keyed on within the development permit code that comes forward ultimately to council. Yep. <coughs> Just because they're, you know, the, the traffic moves fast, uh, faster there too than it does in city center, so that's all good. Okay. Councillor Reed. Thank you. Uh, through you to Mr. McIntyre, where is the access and egress for the parking? Thank you, through your worship. It is uh, proposed off of North Road. Sort of in the middle of the building, or or at that end. I couldn't see it. If it's there. Pull up an elevation here. I can find it. So that and where is the parking bay or the loading bay? Thank you, um, three worship. The loading bay. There's two. Uh, proposed inside and one outside the building right at the uh, same driveway location. There, it's all access from the same place. Okay, so somewhere off North Road then, you don't know quite where. I, I would say attachment two in the oh. public hearing agenda. Okay, gotcha, thank you very much. Got it. For the audience, um, it's about, it looks to be about 100 feet south of Smith on, on North Road, so about two thirds of the way up near the letter C in this drawing. That is correct. Okay. Okay. Seeing none other. Sure. Greg. Good evening, Mayor Stewart, Council, staff. Thanks for the opportunity. My name is Ben Craig. I live at 639 Elmwood Street. 
I live, I'm with the Oakdale Neighborhood Association. We represent about 500 homes in the West Coquitlam area of our city. And our group is generally supportive of this development. I've met with uh, John and his group a number of times over the, over the months. I've been to their open houses. I've met them privately. They've come to our Oakdale AGM. really feel like they've gone out of their way to make time to connect with our community, and we uh, appreciate that. Um, this project, from my understanding, seems to fall within the OCP guidelines. And uh, with the commercial additions, it's a, it's a welcome step towards rejuvenating the uh, somewhat depleted commercial sector in Coquitlam. Uh, and I also think there's a tremendous opportunity here to partner with, with Magusta, the developer and the city, to really enhance our community. And my question is a little bit off the topic of land use, but I, I really hope you'll, you'll bear with me. It does relate directly to this uh, development. And frankly, I've approached counselors and staff and the school board and developers and frankly anybody else who will listen on this idea over the last few months. And I'd really like to just get it on record tonight, if, if I may. Uh, there is a park in the, in the middle of Oakdale uh, on a property uh, that's currently leased from the school board. Uh, this property uh, has a private school on it that, is, that is, is operating on it that works with developmentally challenged kids. Uh, the condition of this park connected to the school has been deteriorating for years. And about a year ago, the school board actually came in and removed half the uh, playground equipment from the park, half the playground apparatus. The field also needs resurfacing. So my question is, um, can we use the uh, parkland improvement portion of the DCCs collected from, from this development uh, to improve this park? Obviously, it would require, you know, uh, cooperation from the province and, and the city. If I'm almost finished, Mayor Stewart, if you could just uh, Well, bear you just with asked me. a question. I'm sorry. You, you referred to it several times as a park, and yet you said the school district removed equipment from it. How would they, why would they remove equipment from a park? Fair enough. So the park is actually part of a property that, is, that a private school is operating on. That private school leases and it's to not space. A park. Fair enough. It's, 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 I'm approaching this from a community perspective because it is a park that's used uh, uh, frequently by kids in the area. It's, it's a community park. From You ask anybody in Oakdale, it's a community park. Yes, it's owned by the school board, but this okay. is a park that's okay. used by, by the community. Okay, uh, the school board doesn't own any parks, and we can't use development cost charges for parks on property owned by someone else. So I, if that's the answer to your, if that was your question, I believe, right? It is, yeah. Okay. yeah. No, I, I understand where you're going, I think. And, uh, but parkland improvement DCCs very strictly must be used for specified parkland improvements on parkland. Um, and, and we, notwithstanding that a playground might be used as a, or might be characterized as a park by some of the neighbors, if it's owned by the school board, it's, uh, it's a school. Uh, Appreciate there's that. There's a school on it, right? Yeah, and I know this was a stretch. Uh, but I, I also know that there's there's millions of dollars being raised uh, from developers, much of which is going towards a fund called Parkland Improvement, and the money is going somewhere. And, and I, my my job tonight is just to get this in front of council uh, and, and get it on record as an area that we'd like to improve in Oakdale. If you're saying that that legally we can't go forward with this, then I accept that. Well, I'll ask staff, but I know that there are very, very, very strict limits on what we use with DCCs, and the limits on parkland uh, improvement DCCs are even more strict than very, very, very. Uh, Mr. Alueva. Yes, uh, thank you, Your Worship, um, and to the speaker. Um, yes, um, unfortunately, we, we, the, the legislation allows the city to build a development cost charge program based on strict rules, uh, both uh, and, and essentially generate a development that generates development cost charges uh, for both park acquisition and park development have to be essentially uh, to fund uh, program elements that are in the program. Uh, so it, it has to be used specifically to fund the acquisition of land for parks that are identified for acquisition in the program and also to build um, uh, park programming elements, what we call park improvement. So there's two components. The park improvement is limited to the uh, elements that are, are that are eligible for funding. So not everything we build in parks is eligible, but that which is identified in the program has to actually be built based on the program that we've uh, that we've set and that council's adopted. 
Uh, development cost charge bylaw does have to have um, uh, approval from Victoria. It's very specifically limited to the elements that can be funded, uh, and the eligibility is, is, is very carefully considered. Um, as noted already by, by um, uh, Mayor Stewart, um, the land that you're mentioning is actually school district property, so th really there's no opportunity for the city to direct uh, development cost charges to that, uh, to improve that land. However, it was a really good try. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and just a uh, final note, I mean, we're seeing tremendous development, thousands of new, new uh, residents coming to our region. There is um, millions of dollars being raised uh, to improve the area. Um, is the, and, and, and my question is, is there an alternative? I mean, this is, it, it, could we look at spirit funds for something like this? Is it, I mean, I know we're, we're really wavering off topic, but uh, I'd like to invite council to come to the park. It's really withering away there, and, and, and it needs improvement. I, I get that. Do you have any comments about the project? <laughs> No, that was the extent okay. of Okay. Uh, well, I, I will. I know Council is working on trying to find parkland in that uh, part of Coquitlam and in other parts of Coquitlam, and um, will undoubtedly take your comments under consideration. And this is a park that you don't have to start from scratch. It's economic because there's a park there already. You just have to improve the we park. We just have to own it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Are there any others? Yes. Worship, Rob Croston. I live at uh, 102705 North Road, the building just to the north of the subject building. Council, staff, uh, we, uh, we at Strata Council of 705-707 North Road are fully supportive of this request to rezone and are keen to understand the impact of OCP as well, since the area right now is designated to be a six-story or ten-story, um, I think it's uh, multifamily dwellings. So that's one, one clarification we're looking for. And likewise, to the member, for um, parkland in the area is constrained, and with the further development of this space and going north, we are looking to get an answer from council on uh, plans around park development for kids and the other children in the city. So on the first question, we'll look, for, well actually the second question looks like an answer that's readily available. We'll get that. Mr. Aluela. Uh, yes, um, thank you, Worship. Uh, um, as uh, the speaker is probably aware, the city is uh, currently working on a neighborhood plan update for the Verkultum Low Heat Area. And as part of that process, uh, uh, Parks, Recreation and Culture is working with planning um, to support the long-term development in the area with additional park uh, and open space. And uh, to date, I think we've identified a minimum of nine acres in that immediate area for longer-term acquisition. And uh, as you'll see very soon, uh, when that neighborhood plan process proceeds to the next level in which there'll be some options presented to the community, uh, at that point, uh, there'll be some additional information on where, how much, and the type of park and open space improvements as well as other amenities in the area um, can, be, um, uh, can be provided for as part of the development of the neighborhood. So there'll be more information coming. Good. Okay, so that's uh, Mr. McIntyre. Nope, okay. Um, thank you, uh, through your worship, to the speaker. Uh, the property, as noted by the speaker, to the north is designated medium density apartment residential, and under that uh, designation could be developed either as an RM2 uh, or RM3 medium density apartment uh, development that could go up to a maximum of eight stories. Um, as Mr. Alueva alluded to, there is a neighborhood plan process going on right now where we are reviewing the land use designations in this neighborhood. Uh, we've just recently concluded uh, two open houses. Um, last month and uh, we're in the process of evaluating those comments and we'll be reporting back to council sometime in the new year on that. Good. Thank you very much. Any other speakers to this item? Any other speakers to this item? Third and final time, any other speakers to this item? Any at all? I'll declare this item closed. Next item, item three, is an application to enter into a heritage revitalization agreement and heritage designation bylaw for 1154 Rochester Avenue. This is bylaws numbers 4626 and 4627. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Jonathan Jackson, development planner with the city. Um, the subject property uh, has frontages on both Vanier and uh, Laval, I'm sorry, Vanier and Rochester Avenue. Uh, it's just west of just west of Laval Street and also just east of Therian Street. 
The OCP designation for the property is neighborhood attached residential. The zoning for the site and to the south and west is RT1 two family residential. To the north is RT1 two family residential and RS3 uh, one family residential. To the east is P2 special institutional, RT1 two family residential and civic institutional, which is also the home of Maillard elementary school or middle school. The current use of the site is one family residential, which is the Edward Davies house, which was built in 1913. Through the proposed uh, heritage revitalization agreement, the applicant is proposing to restore and rehabilitate Edward Davies house as part of a three lot subdivision. The lot containing Edward Davies house will have a carriage house, which you see on the uh, upper left and upper right uh, slides there. And the two lots, uh, the two new lots containing the new houses will contain secondary suites. The proposed heritage designation bylaw will also provide further legal protection in addition to the proposed heritage revitalization agreement uh, by means of a heritage designation bylaw, which will ensure that future alterations to Edward Davies House uh, cannot occur without the city first approving of the heritage alteration permit. Staff are recommending all final readings to heritage revitalization agreement bylaw 4626-2015 and heritage designation bylaw 4627-2015. Thank you. Thank you. Eric Patterson is our first speaker. He's the applicant or representing the applicant, Patterson Architecture at 810 Keyside, Keyside Drive in New Westminster. Good evening, Your Worship, members of council. Uh, the project before you is presented by staff is up on, on Rochester and an interesting one uh, given the, the nature of the heritage house and the infill that's being proposed for it. Uh, as staff mentioned, it's a 1913 farmhouse and there'll be three lots created uh, with this project uh, with secondary suites and garages. Uh, the site, as mentioned, uh, is at Laval and Rochester with Vanier on the rear of it. Um, it's a wide existing uh, lot uh, sloping substantially from Rochester down to Vanier. Uh, but it's well suited for this infill given the overall size of the existing lot. It is located in historic Maradville, uh, just north of Laval Square. Uh, the house has substantial historic significance, uh, which I'll go into in a moment, um, but there are also, as you'll see on the drawings and whatnot, extreme north-south site slopes, which uh, give us some interesting architectural challenges that we have to work through. In this case, I think you'll see that it really helps uh, on the Rochester frontage. Uh, some quick shots of the house uh, in the upper left is the view from Vanier, so essentially the rear of the house with the uh, driveway apron um, and the east yard with the two-story porch that we learned was built in the 1920s to access an upper floor addition there. Uh, and the view from the uh, looking northeast from Vanier, you can see uh, the house there and as I'll describe in a moment, that essentially was the front of the house uh, facing west. Uh, here's some interior shots. So on the upper left, that's the side that faces Rochester at the moment. And in the upper right is again the front of the house. So Edward Davies was a bachelor English farmer, um, had 10 acres here originally. And uh, we kind of puzzled about why the house faced not to the street. And we put ourselves back in 1913 when Rochester was likely a dirt road wandering through a lot of trees and stumps, quite a bit higher up than this house given the slopes. So Mr. Davies built his house facing west towards his farmland and the view and um, you know callers would I'm sure find their way to the front door this way but uh, it made sense at the time. You can see the view from Rochester there currently just the uh, top of the roof poking up above the current hedge there and the uh, red lines indicate the existing property lines. Uh, a bit of the history of the area as uh, most of you are familiar with. Um, on the right is the drawing that we've used in several presentations, but it shows District Lot 46, which as you recall was the Fraser Mill uh, District Lot that they bought and subdivided to create Millardville. And in the center of that is Laval Square with the Eglise. And immediately above it was Davies 10 acres. Uh, the upper left photo is just a photo that we've used before, but it's a very good shot of what Burquetlam and, and these area farms looked like in the day with strawberries and orchards and things like that. Uh, of note too is this house, and we've described this on other projects, is the house has a, a side-facing dormer peak uh, perpendicular to the main ridge of the house. And that vocabulary we've determined, you know, is an Eastern Canada 
vocabulary, particularly Quebec and Ontario, that did come out here with the settlers from the east. Uh, that Coquitlam Star, great cover page promotion from 1909, telling how wonderful and how big and grand this whole area is going to be someday, uh, which it is today. But back then, I don't think it quite looked like this, but they sure hoped it was going to. So this was used to market these properties to people like Mr. Davies. Statement of significance for the house, um, as I've described, is its physical configuration. It does have porches on three sides, albeit just this one was original. The other two are contemporary additions. The heritage values that we've discovered uh, and, and concluded on this property is uh, that marketing campaign that I mentioned for settlement of Coquitlam, land speculation, uh, particularly following the CPR's decision to move their principal freight yards to uh, out onto the low heat where they are today. Uh, Davies was a bachelor. He worked up north in the Charlottes at a whaling station and then I guess read an ad about how wonderful Coquitlam was going to be and bought some land and settled down here. There's social and historic associations with Millardville's uh, francophone community because after Davies passed away, the property uh, moved to the Gauthiers, which as you know are francophone pioneers in the area. Um, and their extended family stayed in the property right up till 1980. Uh, the home is also valued for its economic associations of the Gauthier Rougeau family working for uh, Fraser Mills in the area. And finally, for its history and aesthetics as an example of Millardville's vernacular Edwardian design traditions. Uh, just a couple of shots there, you can see the upper left, the kind of things that we get to do is peel back the layers and find the original wood siding, and then the charming original chimney, and you can see the kind of condition it is, but that is very restorable. Uh, character defining elements, the third component of a statement of significance, these are the physical things that are extant on a site that retain those heritage values. So things like the continuous use as a home, its siting on the property, uh, its simplicity of form and scale and its basic T-shaped massing. Uh, and then there's those two little peak gables and you might recall those from other projects we've brought before you. Um, in this case, they're very modest little peak gables, but Davies or his carpenter slash designer uh, were picking up on the continuity of this tradition. The lower left photo, uh, a bit of a distorted panel. Uh, shows this wonderful collection of timber posts and braces for the front porch. And uh, we struggled with this, not knowing, was this original or somebody's idea later on? And I looked very closely at how it was built. And uh, again, put us ba ourselves back in 1913. You've got a property full of trees, and uh, you want to build an interesting front porch. And there was a lot of log building, a lot of pole barns used in the area. So I'm sure Mr. Davies, again, and his carpenter just thought, let's build it with poles. So it's quite an interesting collection of logs and poles that we hope to restore. And that'll be up facing Rochester as kind of a very interesting thing that you'll see from the sidewalk. Uh, site planning for the project, you can see the, uh, the three houses on the uh, facing up towards Rochester, the Heritage House in the upper left. So it's rotated and moved. So yes, that character defining element is compromised uh, through what's called rehabilitation. So now the house will face Rochester. It's appropriate, that is the front of the house. And so we felt that that was a reasonable compromise. Uh, the interesting thing with siting of the infill houses is they're set well back of the front of the heritage house and well below the top of the heritage house roof. Um, you also see some rhododendrons along the property line at the top there. The yard is currently has these wonderful mature Rhodos that are quite uh, salvageable and reusable. Rhodos are a very hardy shrub, so we hope to see those in an upper level planter right up at the sidewalk again for some nice color and continuity with the new development. Uh, the carriage house in the bottom left is over a two car garage. Uh, the building, you can see a dashed line, so the dwelling above is cantilevered over top of the garage just to set the garage back and reduce its impact on the street. There is a lower level entrance and a porch above for the carriage house to really try and create a uh, residential feel on Banyan. Parking, uh, there's uh, 12 possible parking spaces on the lot, one more than is required for each lot. So they each have a two car attached garage, well, one being in the carriage house. Uh, the tandem spot for the carriage house is tucked over to the side, so it'll always be available. And then that apron is available for more ad hoc parking. And then as indicated, there's two ad hoc uh, tandem spots available in front of the infill garages. So uh, without sort of paving the world, as you know, I'm always up here preaching, let's not uh, 
uh, design our world completely around cars. We tried to strike a balance between parking facilities and green space. Uh, design aspects, you can see the two infill houses on the left there. Simple rectangular massing, again, similar to the Heritage House. The roof pitches are consistent with the Heritage House. Uh, we've used a little diamond vent detail in the attic of the Heritage House on the new houses for a little character. Uh, the siding, uh, vocabulary, historic colors, and nice things like wood paneled garage doors, not metal, and nice stained natural fur front doors for each of the houses. The, uh, the front door on the Davies house is no longer there, so we can estimate what it would have looked like in that era. And then just a few notes you can see about what we're doing to restore the Heritage House. Um, the 3D views that uh, I noticed the planner usurped me and used these instead, but you're welcome to them. You've seen these before. Uh, the view from Rochester in two directions, noticing how the Heritage House has more prominence than the infill and those nice little um, Diamond Vents giving the project a nice bit of character. Uh, the views down on Vanier, uh, albeit with the slopes, you can see the line of Rochester and behind there, quite substantial. Um, but we think it's going to make a nice streetscape on Vanier with the prominence going to the carriage house and the small, intimate character of that building. And that concludes my presentation. If you have any opportunity to answer questions, if there are any arising. Well, I'll ask it. Um, the two new homes have secondary suites. Uh, they provide two parking spaces in the two-car garage, the trust. And then uh, where is the accessory parking for the secondary suite? That's in the two tandem spots. Uh, you can see the tandem. car uh, indicated in front of the garage. So if they use one, the other is available for the homeowner. So the suite could be in either one of those two tandem spots. Okay. Um, Council has always expressed its frustration over applications that include tandem parking because of the unlikelihood that the owners of this home are going to let their tenants park behind them so that they can't leave in the morning and all of those sorts of things. So that's, that presents a challenge and I don't know, it would appear that um, my, that's a 15% grade, I think, out, out that driveway. Is it or? Um, the lower portion is steep and then up towards the garage that flattens out. Um, that's why we tried to provide an additional tandem on each property. It's we're not relying on the single tandem that meets the bylaw. It, we're giving two. So there's a little more options here. Given the size of the lots and the whole overall available land, um, this is pretty much all that was available for parking areas. Uh, there's also a street parking spot that we, the position of those <laughs> crossings, there's okay. one spot We've left. We've been here many here. times. Yep. Um, the street parking doesn't, uh, isn't well received by some members of council. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've got Jurinder Bakra at 4-9 Monday. Good evening, Your Worship. My name is Grinder Rakra. I'm the of Lotus Project, owners of 1154 Rochester. I'd like to say that we're very excited about the preservation and restoration of the Edward Davies House, a home that has significant history in the heritage of the Millardville. Last month, we visited our neighbors uh, on Rochester, Vanier, Laval, and Hammond, explained the HRA process. I'd also mention that we'll be retaining the current heritage home on 1154 Rochester. Many of the neighbors that we visited um, were actually surprised that the home was over 100 years old. Um, this is all the vinyl cladding that's on it right now, and no one really thought it was a heritage home, I guess, until you get into the history of it. So we're actually very excited to bring the home back to its original style and original glory. And I'd like to thank the city planners, Eric, and all the people involved at the moment. Uh, they come up with a uh, nice site layout that provides uh, three small homes uh, for smaller single family residential homes for affordable housing choices. Thank you. Thank 
you. Are there any other speakers to this item? Apart from them. Councillor Hodge. Yes, um, I think council did receive one uh, comment on, on this one uh, from a resident on Rochester Avenue and uh, she asked a question which I guess the appropriate thing to do is to uh, just ask it publicly and then the answer is on the record. Um, her concern is about, uh, about this proposal is the preservation of the uh, evergreens on the property. I think this is the, the only letter we received on this one and uh, certainly I've often myself uh, raised the issue about tree retention so uh, maybe uh, we could just find out uh, um, about the tree retention on this property and what's possible. Yes, through your worship, uh, staff did work with the applicant to um, review the trees on site. It was determined that um, the two large conifers on the subject property, one being 0.8 meters at diameter at breast height and the other 0.4 meters, um, were in locations that were not retainable due to the, the relative uh, proximity to the building envelopes. Um, they're right kind of in the center of the site. Um, as well, the site uh, is quite steep and required some grading adjustments, which would also interfere with the root zones of those trees. There's additionally two conifers on the Vanier Boulevard as well that are on city property. Um, those were looked at through the review of the off-site servicings proposed for Vanier Avenue, and unfortunately they are right in the middle of where the sidewalks need to go. Uh, additionally, there's uh, four Japanese maples proposed on site for replacement trees to compensate for those being lost. Okay, thank you. Councillor Zarillo. Um, first of all, I want to I, I want to thank the proponent for 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 bringing this forward. It is it is. Uh, important to keep our heritage. I, I'm not saying that every house should be kept, but I, I appreciate that. But I did want to make a comment of something that struck me today was just the irony that we work so hard to keep the heritage house, but we disregard the fact that these were farmlands and that there was open land and we actually grew our own food in these regions. So I think it's equally as important to keep in mind that this this was an area where people grew their own food and when there, where there was land for uh, that sort of activity. So that just struck me today that we're talking so much about house, 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 and we're disregarding the heritage of, of our farmland. Um, so I had a question about street frontage on Vanier. Will there be street improvements on Vanier with this project? I see that it's a very strangely shaped street, and I've driven down there in the past, and it is kind of awkward. Yes, through your worship, there will be street improvements on Vanier Avenue that will include curb, gutter, and uh, sidewalk improvements. Uh, there is unfortunately not room, uh, as, as you know, due to the awkwardness of the street, there's not enough room in the boulevard to get street trees on this frontage, but there will be sidewalk, curb, and gutter, and the overall pavement width will be widened ever so slightly as well. So we'll have a little bit of sidewalk in front of that development, but it won't go all the way to Laval? That's correct, but there will be transition um, pieces proposed from the sidewalk um, to the road edge um, for the interim and as other sites develop through this area, I note that it's neighborhood attached residential and so many of the lots do have free future development potential, um, then those off-site servicings will be secured at those times. So I see the one on the corner, looks like it's going to be there a while. Um, uh, Councillor Hodge asked about the trees and I'm wondering about the cedars that are along the front. Like at this point in time, the, the whole frontage is cedared out so you can't actually see the home really from the street. So are those all coming down? Like is, the, is there going to be some visibility to this heritage house? Yes, through your worship, uh, the cedar hedging along the Rochester Avenue frontage is proposed to be removed and there are six mature rhododendron uh, shrubs on site that are proposed to be relocated along that Rochester Avenue frontage instead. Okay, yeah, because when I drove by it this morning, because I'm going to go by there every day, you can't see the house. So I've got some concerns about this. Um, uh, my concerns are uh, related to just the amount of buildings in this space, but also we have two schools right by here. There's a lot of traffic, a lot of kids walking. 
And I'm concerned that the way the parking configuration is with everything backloaded off of Vanier, that we're going to get a whole bunch of par cars parked along Rochester, which is a problem because of that Laval, the so close to the corner, it's a school, the children's crosswalk. So I have some real concerns about, for the Heritage House at least, that they're gonna use street parking. It's, it's, it's a hike to come in from the back, plus you gotta come up a lot of stairs because of the uh, steepness of it. So I've got some concerns about that, which, I mean, I, I guess it's impossible to have front loading on this. I mean, I know it's very steep. But I, I don't feel good that somebody that lives in the heritage house at the front will park at the back and walk up through through that. And the other thing I wanted to mention was, um, I think that these residents have asked me that if, 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 if we're going to do heritage revitalization that we don't, and for lack of a better term, take advantage of the process where we actually forgive uh, the density regulations for the zoning because it's a heritage rev revitalization. And, and I honestly feel that in this one, um, we're just asking to pile too much onto one site. The topography of the site is difficult. Its locations to schools is difficult. So uh, Councillor O'Neill is passing me uh, notes here that I don't need to talk about this right now, and it's probably true. So um, I guess my questions were, were the ones I asked, and just to, to let you know that I do have some concerns about this, and I might have some more questions later. Thank you, Councillor O'Neill. Okay, thank you. Um, just to be clear, that there is a that's a parking pocket um, along Rochester. There's a, a, a curb extension uh, at the east end of the block, two 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 doors down. Uh, so that is intended for parking all the way along Austin, on the south side of the Rochester, rather, on the south side of Rochester. Um, okay, are there any other speakers to this item? Are there any other speakers to this item? The third and final time, are there any other speakers to this item? I'll declare this item closed. Thank you, Your Worship. Next item, item four, is an application to amend City of Coquitlam Zoning Bylaw number 3000 in order to rezone the properties at 945 and 951 Charland Avenue from RS1 one-family residential to RM3 multi-story medium density apartment residential. These are bylaws number 4623 and 4635. Thank you. Um, Chris Jarvie, development planner, City of Coquitlam, once again. Uh, this is a rezoning application for corner of Blue Mountain Street and Charland Avenue. Properties are currently designated medium density apartment residential in the Austin Heights neighborhood plan. The application proposes to rezone the property to RM3, uh, which would facilitate a four story building of 41 units. Uh, this is the proposed site plan. Access for the parking is located off of Charland Avenue. The loading is accessed off of the lane and the main pedestrian access point is off of Charland Avenue as well. This is the elevation that would face Charland Avenue. And this is the one that would face Blue Mountain to the west. In order to facilitate the development, the applicant has requested a num number of variances as well as a text amendment. The text amendment would increase the allowable density in the RM3 zone for special needs or affordable housing. Uh, they've also requested a 15% reduction to parking to reduce the parking by eight spaces, uh, as well as a 70% reduction to common amenity space and a 4% increase in lot coverage. Staff recommend that Council refer bylaws 4623 and 4635 back to staff to ensure that they are more consistent with the RM3 zone. Thank you. We have three registered speakers. We begin with the uh, proponent from Red Brick Pro Abdul Juan. And they're at 522 7th Street in New Westminster. Good evening. I'd uh, like to present some context in which we're making this proposal, in particular, proposal. 
I'll talk a little bit about the rental housing uh, state, and I will also discuss some issues about parking, as that um, is important to Council. Uh, we've uh, done some extensive community consultation about this particular project. <clears throat> we sent out 346 information packages to um, households within 100 metres of the site. <clears throat> that package was very detailed, uh, detailed every, all the uh, information about the specific project, the parking, the suites, and uh, the type of proposal we're presenting. <clears throat> we made a presentation to the Tri-Cities Housing and Homelessness Task Group on December 4th, and our, the feedback was overwhelmingly positive. We provided an open house, which was advertised in our information package, as well as in the Tri-City News. And <clears throat> 10 people attended the open house, and seven people filled out forms, and it was overwhelmingly positive feedback. Until now, um, we have not received a single piece of negative feedback about the project. The, the community is overwhelmingly positive about it. And uh, in, in, as indicated to us that the community badly needs the rental housing. <clears throat> The context of our proposal is one of a rental housing crisis, which is particularly acute in the city of Coquitlam. We've had in the last few weeks uh, some alarming information in the press regarding the rental housing crisis, and in particular, new research from the Rental Housing Index has singled out Coquitlam as being in a particular dire state with its rental housing uh, state. The Rental Housing Index ranks municipalities across Canada on issues related to rental housing supply, demand, and affordability. I'm, of the Everyone at the table wants more rental housing. We are absolutely supportive of rental housing. I, I'd urge you to speak to the project, though. The, um, I, I need to speak towards the parking. Yeah, it's up to you. I'm just letting you know that uh, you've, you've, you had us on rental housing. Um, the, the, you may want to speak to the concerns. It's up to you. Wait, the state of the rental housing is one which the illegal suites dominate supply. So the city data indicates that illegal suites represents 50% of the total market. RHI indicates that illegal suites may total as much as 6,913 suites, meaning it might be as much as 60% of the market. So rental housing has not been built in the last 35 years, and now it's dominated by illegal suites. Now, in the council meeting on November 9th, what was discussed most is the parking issue. With illegal suites dominating the market, representing as much as 6,913 suites, these suites don't conform to the parking bylaw or the zoning bylaw. The parking bylaw requires each of these suites to have one parking stall each. What that means is the city is missing as much as 6,913 parking stalls directly due to the lack of purposeful rental housing over the last 35 years. That means that the city is missing as much as 15% of the housing stock or 60% of the rental housing stock in terms of parking stalls. So we believe that with the cost of constructing an underground parking stall at $45,000, the oversupply of parking in the bylaw for rental housing is unnecessarily inhibiting its development, forcing the proliferation of illegal suites, and therefore exacerbating the, the supply of parking in the city. In other words, we believe the parking, the oversupply of parking in the bylaw is the cause of the parking supply problems. We're not the first people to figure this out. The mayor of New West wrote a paper as a student at, at, at uh, SFU, and in his research, he figured out that parking requirements for developing new rental properties in the region far exceed demand and is unnecessarily inhibiting rental housing development. His research also discovered that it's clear that parking represents a big opportunity to solve the economic disparity between rental and strata, meaning it's the, it's the oversupply of parking that's causing the problem in, in which rental housing has not been built in the last 35 years. He's suggesting from his research, research that it would be reasonable to reduce parking requirements for rental buildings by 30% in locations that have access to transportation but are not along a frequent transit network. And I should note that our variance is half that, a request. Metro Vancouver did an apartment study, apartment parking study in 2012 in which they noted strata housing requires 60 to 70 percent more parking than rental and purpose-built rental sites demand range is in 0.58 to 0.72 vehicles per unit. We're providing 1.07 in our proposal. They also noted that visitor parking is oversupplied and only requires 0.1 stalls per unit. In order to give council some comfort with the amount of parking that we're providing, which is 44 stalls in a 1.07 ratio, we looked at other municipalities that offer secured market rental bylaws for parking. In particular, we looked at the city of Vancouver, 
And in your public hearing brief, it indicates that there's a 10% relaxation in the city of Vancouver for secured market rental. We believe that's inaccurate. We've provided the zoning bylaw and working with Rob Waite, who's in charge of the parking bylaw in the city of Vancouver, we determined if our proposal was subject to their zoning bylaws, it would require 20 parking spots. Working with Michael Epp in the city of North Vancouver, we determined in that city if our proposal was subject to their bylaws, we would require 28 spots. And in the city of New West, we also believe the public hearing brief is inaccurate, that relaxations are available within 400 meters of transit as well as further than 400 meters from transit. Working with Barry Waite at that, uh, in that city planning department, we determined that the amount of parking required according to their bylaws would be 26 to 37 spots. An interesting issue to note is that we're offering 44 spots or a ratio of 1.07, considerably more than what any of these municipalities might require. We showed a number of secured market rental examples at the November 9th Council and Committee meeting. And these are 14 more distinct examples. And what you'll notice, it's hard to read, but the parking ratios required for all of them are considerably less than one. In the public hearing brief, um, it was noted that CACs are not waived for uh, secured market rental housing in Vancouver. We don't believe that's entirely accurate. CACs are calculated for every project from rental housing to strata. But we have a written submission from Michael Naylor of the City of Vancouver in which he clearly states that CACs are not appropriate for secured market rental housing in most cases and particularly when the developer has to purchase land to build a unit. In summary, our proposal addresses the significant market rental shortage in the City of Coquitlam. It is the first standalone proposal uh, in Coquitlam in the last 35 years and importantly the housing affordability strategy was passed by council on December 7th unanimously, and our proposal is 100% consistent with policy direction 1.23 and 1.24. In particular, it appears that those policy directions were specifically written with our proposal in mind. It is also consistent with high priority action item number three and high priority action item number four, which has uh, been slated by council for implementation immediately in the next year. Our proposal also comes at no financial cost to the city and we believe will go a significant way to alleviating the rental housing crisis in the city. Thank you. Councilor uh, Asmussen. Thank you. Just, I, I know we just did our uh, affordable housing strategy and we, we gave it first reading and some of these uh, relaxations on uh, parking and amenity space was in there. Um, <clears throat> do you agree with the statement just now that these are written in the same vein as what's being proposed here? Mr. McIntyre. <clears throat> yes, Your Worship. Um, just to ask today, a quick uh, comparison, checking with some of the other municipalities, and we have some other information, but it's it's a little different to, com to compare project by project that was that was set up there. Um, so I can't really comment further on that. In, in terms of the, the, the parking relaxations, as Council's aware, that's one of the things that we identified in the housing affordability strategy, well, just a week tonight, a week ago tonight, that we should look at that what would be a reasonable um, and workable uh, reduction in parking for rental housing. <clears throat> Uh, and given a certain locational criteria. So that's, that's a piece of work we are going to do. So I, I can't say at this point in time, 10% so works, 15%, 30% works. I, I just don't have that information at hand. So at this point in time, uh, rental reduction could be 1.25, could be one, could be 0 0.80. We haven't set a parameter in that yet, have we? No, we have not. Okay, thank you. Mr. O'Neill. Yes, thank you very much. I was going to wait to ask this question until a little later, but um, since the general manager of uh, planning and development has uh, already warmed up, I think I'll uh, ask this now. So I'm just, uh, as much for the public as for me, uh, on November 9th when this first came before council, um, the, uh, there was some reluctance uh, from the planning department to um, proceed with it, but council directed um, at that time uh, city staff to prepare a bylaw and bring it to first reading. 
And at that, that was November 23rd, uh, that that came before us. And, and the recommendation from staff at first reading was uh, to give first reading, essentially in support. Um, and now um, the recommendation now is an alt as a two-pronged one, either give it second and third reading after the public hearing or <coughs> refer it, and the staff recommendation is actually to refer it um, back to staff to continue working with the applicant. The alternate recommendation is to give second and third reading. What happened between first reading where staff said, uh, recommended support and this report where staff is actually recommending send it back to staff and or, or alternate recommendations, second and third reading. Um, what happened uh, to change the recommendation of staff? Well, I think we'd have to go back to the original recommendation of staff, which was to send it back to staff. Council but, asked yeah. staff to bring us a first reading report, and staff did that, and then they're based on council's request, uh, staff recommended that we give it first reading in a public hearing. Um, but I don't know that council convinced staff of their, that they were, that they were off base related to their concerns about parking. But I'm gonna- uh, Well, staff didn't have to recommend. We just said bring it back. We didn't say with what recommendation. We get things uh, brought to us uh, without rec I, 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 recommending I, against it. So I, why did they recommend it at first reading and they're not recommending it here at second, for second and third? I, I, won't, I, I won't answer with the why are they not recommending it here. I suspect they recommended it at first reading because they knew that that's what staff, the council asked them to do, which was bring it and give it a public hearing. So they recommended we give it a public hearing. Um, but I'll go to Mr. McIntyre. He may have a, well, he may have a better answer than that. Uh, thank you, Worship. And just very briefly, uh, you, you, you set out the, the sequence there. Um, at the start, um, after the staff review, and as much as we'd like to support this, I think Council's well aware staff is very keen on rental, market rental housing. Uh, we felt that the extent of variance was being requested, requested, particularly on this site and this location, we had trouble with that. So that's why our, our initial recommendation was to refer it back to staff. If we recommended it be declined and the bylaw was defeated at that time, then there's that six month clock, unless it's brought back, we kick in. So that's why we'd recommend it be referred back to staff to hopefully work with the applicant to bring it closer in line with the RM3 zoning. At that time, council was, there was a vote and I think um, <clears throat> the initial recommendation lost and there was an alternate motion put forward. And it was very clear that the majority of council at that evening wanted to, the application that had the opportunity to proceed to public hearing. And so we, we are observant and, and want to serve council and instructions. So the next report that came back provided that recommendation was what, and I'm, I'm sorry, maybe we shouldn't have cleared in that report. It's not the wording in our mouth. We're trying to put that out there, that motion for council to act on, because our sense was that you wanted to take it on to a public hearing. So that's why it's here tonight. Yeah. But in this public hearing brief, we wanted to, again, be clear. We stick to our, our original um, view and, and position on this application, and that's our recommendation, but we have provided an alternate recommendation, so we don't want to uh, hem council in. If there is a majority of council want to proceed further past this point, once the public hearing closes, there is a recommendation there before you can then work with. Thank you. Uh, because there was some confusion there, because the one big event dealing with market rental housing that took place between November 23rd, when you recommended first reading and tonight, was the passage of the affordable uh, housing affordability strategy, which strongly recommends the development of, of uh, non -mark, uh, of market rental housing uh, and all sorts of provisions to uh, to support that, uh, including perhaps some uh, uh, parking uh, e ease, easing parking restriction or uh, regulations, easing um, amenity space, things like that. So that's the one thing that happened between first reading and here, and yet. The staff recommendation comes back opposite from what it was at first. So it is confusing to people, but thank you for the explanation. Okay. Uh, keeping in mind that they recommended first reading in a public hearing. Tonight's recommendation isn't related to first reading in a public hearing. Tonight's recommendation is whether or not it should proceed to second and third, and the recommendation is to not proceed to second and third. But, <coughs> but we, uh, just one more thing. We have received reports in the past where first reading is not recommended. I agree, and okay, we got so, and we and that we, was, we got one a month ago, right. and we council in its wisdom um, said no. We want a first reading uh, report, and 
the first reading report came back. I would have preferred that they'd have stuck, stuck no, that, to the that recommendation was... that they had originally had, which was uh, return, return it. That report a month ago was not a first reading. That was a preliminary report of some sort. It wasn't a, a I agree. first reading. And we so. asked them to produce a first reading report. That's what council did. And they could have recommended, if they really felt strongly against it, not... They could have, and I, 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 agree. I agree with you on that point. I, and I actually said to Mr. McIntyre, I wish you'd have just you know, stuck to your recommendation because I knew this, this question was going to come up tonight, a little bit of confusion. Councillor Martin. Thank you. A um, couple of quick questions, and perhaps uh, the applicant might uh, address one of them. The, uh, the request for the parking reduction is related to the accessibility of transit or, or the proximity to transit. Um, in looking at the proposal, it would appear that the shortest route to transit is going to actually be exiting out the back of the building into the lane and then walking up the street. Um, could you shed any light, excuse the pun, on what the lighting and safety features in the lane might be that is going to make it uh, accessible for folks to, to get back and forth to transit in the most direct route? So um, we don't have our, our architect here tonight. We can address any issues with respect to safety, um, make that um, acceptable to staff. I, I can't shed any light on it right at this moment. Okay, all right. Um, and in your presentation, you spoke about price point and, and, a, and recent reports showing the challenges here in Coquitlam. Was there something specific you, you felt relevant to point out to us and how this is going to address that specific problem? Is there is there a component of this project that's you know, below market or is gonna, gonna help with address that? It's not below market, it is a market rental building fitting in with the housing affordability strategy. But what we've done in adding the 41 units in adding more density in fewer parking spots, which are justified with our parking report, is that enables us to take advantage of the density that's allowed on site with more units that are each of them smaller. And smaller units are a huge uh, benefit because we can reduce the absolute amount of rent on each one, making each suite affordable to the end user. So we're expecting one bedroom rents at $1,000, which is barely above what's in the existing market, and two bedroom rents of 1280 which are actually really comparable to the older stock. Because the older stock, you'll see one bedrooms that are maybe 700 square feet, and we're offering 577 square feet. What you're going to do is be able to afford the unit, but just trade off some space for a brand new unit. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sandy Burpee. And there he is. Five, five, two, Foster Avenue. Your Worship, Councillors. Sandy Burpee, I'm uh, Chair of the Tri-City Homeless Housing Task Group, or actually co-chair now. I live at 553 Foster Avenue. I'm here tonight with uh, other members of the uh, task group who are sitting over here uh, to speak in favor of this project proposal. Uh, I know you're aware of the current dire straits of rental housing in Coquitlam and things are getting worse, particularly with developments around the Evergreen Line. But this project is significant to me and to DAS Group for three reasons. First of all, because it's the first standalone purpose belt rental project in Coquitlam in, in the last almost 40 years, uh, not including the uh, Blue Sky development, which would be a standalone building, but part of a larger development. The second point of significance, and this is one that I haven't, uh, um, Councillor uh, uh, Morrison just asked the question, and I haven't seen any reference to this in any discussion so far. Um, in reports in the project, but it has to do with the affordability. The rents in this building will be affordable to at least some households that are in the low to moderate income range. So that's $35,000 to $60,000 uh, a year. That is a, a group of people for which we've been advocating for the last three years for affordable rent, and that's really been our, our main focus when it comes to affordability. And this affordability comes with no financial incentives from the city. So there's no direct cash infusion. Uh, there's no loss of revenue, um, just concessions to, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the bylaw in the way of amenity spaces and parking. So the question was, uh, for one bedroom apartment, 
$1,000 equates to using the, the conventional ma method of calculating affordability to a affordable income of $40,000. Two bedrooms, 1280, equivalent to 51,200. And further, these um, rents are very close to BC Housing's housing income limits, below which households qualify for social housing. So I think being able to, to get um, rentals um, in this range um, uh, without any um, financial support from the city is really a significant uh, event as, so far as I'm concerned. And then of course the third um, significance is provides the first opportunity to demonstrate the effectiveness of the housing affordability strategy to actually to create more affordable rental housing in the Tri-Cities. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our uh, last registered speaker, Ross Brebner, who's speaking on behalf of St. Lawrence Anglican Church, 825 St. Lawrence. Good evening, uh, Your Worship, members of Council. My name is Ross Bremner. I am speaking on behalf of St. Lawrence Anglican Church, located at 825 St. Lawrence Street in Coquitlam. Just a few comments. Um, our church did a parish review most recently, and when we reviewed the issues of social justice within our community, affordable housing was at the very, very top. So given that, it should not be a surprise then that when this particular uh, proposal uh, was presented to our church council for their review, uh, it was supported unanimously, which gives me the authority then to come to you and convey that St. Lawrence supports this project. As has been stated earlier, uh, the community is in dire need of affordable, purposeful uh, rental housing. And as noted, this requires some changes to the city's bylaws. One that's been discussed extensively is the question around parking. So as a lay person, when I was looking at this, the 15% uh, reduction, uh, 52 parking stalls to 44, I was asking myself, what, what's really important here? And I thought, well, you know, I'm going to refer to Maslow and his hierarchy of needs. What is important? And I'll give you the first four. <coughs> Air, food, water. Number four, the shelter. I'm just guessing that the opportunity or need to park your car is somewhere further down the list. That, I think, is something that we need to consider, is what is really important. And the importance of shelter. And this provides that opportunity to those who have marginal income. When we take a look at those who are putting out 40, 50 percent of their income or more for housing at the cost, at the cost of a improved quality of life. This concept that's being brought forward will assist those with respect to their quality of life and their opportunity of advancement. So given that, on behalf of St. Lawrence Anglican Church and its 170 families, we respectfully ask that Council support the Red Brick Properties proposal. Thank you. I, w I wonder if I could just ask one question, sure. and with, with respect, uh, you, you, your um, committee examined the proposal. Is there, was consideration given, uh, could we reduce parking requirements even further? Is no. There, no. No. So this is the right, the right spot? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Zrillo. Questions for staff. The first one is about how far is this... Um, uh, complex from Lougheed Sky Train Station. Can you give me the meters, please, from the Lougheed Sky Train Station? And we got that, Mr. McIntyre. <coughs> I'm going to yeah, calculate it from. Uh, uh, we're just checking that number, but yeah. you're probably in the, in the vicinity of a kilometer, and if how, not more. 
<clears throat> Remind me how far away was the Blue Sky project from the Berquitlam SkyTrain station? It, it was within 400 meters of the Berquitlam SkyTrain station. It was in, station. within 400 meters. I don't remember that. Sorry, 800 meters. Eight, yeah, thank you. Five. 800 meters. Five. So we're not looking at a big difference. Um, okay, my next question is about the amenity space. What is the amenity space going to be used for in this building? Thank you, uh, through your worship. Um, that hasn't, that level of detail hasn't been determined yet. Um, right now at this point, they're showing uh, approximately 140 square foot uh, room that has a wheelchair accessible bathroom. And uh, through the development permit process, uh, should council grant second and third readings, we would uh, determine that with the applicant as uh, what kind of use will be in there. Well, I, I kind of need to know what the amenity space is going to be used for because it seems to me in the report it said that we're looking at a room that's about 8 feet by 11 feet, which is really uh, a child's bedroom size. So I'm just trying to understand what, like if we're going to reduce amenity space, we need to know why we're reducing it, what we're going to use it for. So I need an, I need to get an answer to what we're using the amenity space for, because I won't be able to know if it's enough or not enough if I don't know what we're using it for. So I'll let, I'll let that be the Mr. Jordan. Uh, perhaps the applicant uh, may wish to come up and speak to that as what they have planned for that space. Um, there's two uh, amenity space, indoor and outdoor. The indoor amenity space we can reserve for a small meeting room. It's not that different from some of the meeting rooms they have in some of the larger buildings where they use it for a strata council. We actually won't have a strata council, but if people in the rental building want to get together and meet to play cards or something like that, they can do so in that room and we can set up a card table or some kind of recreation like that. We have outdoor amenity space as well, which we'll set up for, most likely for a barbecue area. Am I allowed to ask the proponent a question about that? Yes. <laughs> to the chair. Am I allowed sure. to ask a question while you there? Yeah. Um, what about washer and dryers? Is there washer and dryers in the suite or is there? In the suite. All the suites. But will the person have to bring their own washer and dryer or will it be? We'll supply washers and dryers in each suite. Okay. So what I'm, the notes I made were either a game room or a small meeting room and there will be furniture there, tables and chairs. We can supply that, yes, and an outdoor amenity area for a barbecue area. Thank you. And I have the answer to your first question. Uh, put in the map, it's 2.4 kilometers or 2.2 kilometers, depending on which route you go. Um, okay, 2.2 kilometers. Um, um, uh, my machine's faster than yours. It's 28 minutes. <laughs> if you don't mind, and about two hours on the way back, yes, because it is uphill. If you don't mind, just to be clear, it's, it's a three-minute bus drive. So, you know, you get on the bus, and maybe it's three to five minutes, and you're down there. Maybe six minutes. Six to eight minutes. So probably six minutes. Yeah. That's about a, not, not, count, not counting the time you had to wait, but, uh, yep. Okay. Bike racks accommodated. Is there cycle storage? Uh, through your worship, yes, that is correct. Uh, per the zoning bylaw, they have required the they have provided the required uh, long term bike parking. Awesome. Okay, I'm done. Thanks. Okay. Are there any other speakers to this item? Mr. Poy. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name's Albert Poy. I live at 2340 Haversley Avenue, Coquitlam, BC. On this project, I have some great concerns and I urge you to think about them. First of all, there's no cost benefit analysis, okay? What is it, what's in this project for changing from a R1 residential to multifamily, besides adding 60 or 70 cars to the congestion problem. Think about that when you're making your mind up. 
The second thing I'd like you to think about as we get into this high density of more con uh, uh, congestion, about what you talked about last week at your budget meeting. Let me give you an example. You said we're going to have a 2.3% tax increase, the lowest in seven years or six years. Well, as this density and this project contributes to it, you're also going to increase over the next four years between 2017 and 2020, another 16% tax increase. Now you talk about affordability. Think about the affordability of us seniors who are paying these tax increases. I'm not feeling sorry for a developer who was building market accommodation. I did that in my life and I didn't get one cent of subsidy from any municipality. I hate to tell you, there's been rental accommodation built. Look around at the monster houses. The one on my street, they want two, and I'm talking about density now, they want $2.1 million for it, and yeah, they got the price Three. of the monster house on your street doesn't have a lot to do with this project. So It I, does. It's I, got to do with the density. I'm talking of density, sir. I urge you to focus on the project. I'm focusing on the project on this density. This here project is adding 60 to 70 cars. Going by my house in density, this is going to contribute to the problem. Our problem is, in density, with just projects doing is Westwood Plateau and Burke Mountain. They have turned Como Lake, Mariner Way, Chilco, Austin Avenue, and Blue Mountain into freeways. This project will add to that problem, and not once have any one of us been consulted on it. It'll add to the tax increases, which are exorbitant. I have seen no cost benefit say these people are going to contribute to the three times we have had tax increases since 19, 2007 to fund the RCMP. That's what this project does. It moves density and tax increases onto the homeowner. It also, this project, is restricting the number of detached homes in Coquitlam. All that's doing is making the other detached homes go up more. I urge you to think about the big picture. You talk about affordability. I was assured by this council that our development costs paid for everything. But two weeks ago, I read in the paper, you're urging for more CAC of 5000 per house and $3 per square foot. That's not going to make this rental housing any more affordable. I suggest you take a hard look at Coquitlam's policy because our taxes for seniors and this project is one of them that affects them greatly, keep going up. This density, remember, half of you have written back to me that density increases costs. And I'll start naming names if I have to. Thank you. Please do not approve any more high density projects in the Austin area and the Millardville area. You have already made everyone, gave everyone a new a, an ability to have a, a laneway house or a suite, but you have not done your homework and told me how we're going to keep our taxes low, nor have you told me where those cars are going to go or provide it for them. I get Burke Mountain, Westwood Plateau coming down my street every day. There's 1,500 more cars on Austin Avenue today than there was five years ago. Think of that before you approve this. Quit. I urge you to quit making the problem. Solve it first. 
Don't cry to me about more transit funding. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers to this item? Are there any other speakers to this item? Third and final time. Are there any other speakers to this item? Seeing none, I'll declare this item closed. And the public hearing closed. Okay, we're going to reconvene in a few minutes. They're going to change um, systems that record our meetings. We will have a regular council meeting, as I mentioned earlier. With this, these four projects will likely be included, at least a discussion. Not sure we'll vote, but uh, these four items will be coming up shortly. Thank you, Worship.